seminary. And the director, uh, conductor of the Holy Trinity Monastery slash Seminary Choir. Uh, he previously studied at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, graduating with a degree in Russian language and uh, Russian literature. And he spent a few years teaching at St. John of, of San Francisco Orthodox Academy, located at the Russian Orthodox Cathedral in San Francisco. And he also, in San Francisco, started a group called Conquering Time, which is a cultural group which uh, basically seeks to perpetuate the legacy which was began, which was um, made uh, propagated by C.S. Lewis, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, George Williams, and other uh, luminaries. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce Nicholas Kotar. Thank you. Dostoevsky once let drop the enigmatic phrase, beauty will save the world. What does this mean? For a long time, it used to seem to me that this was a mere phrase. How could such a thing be possible? When had it ever happened in the bloodthirsty course of history that beauty had saved anyone from anything? Beauty has provided embellishment, certainly, given uplift, but whom has it ever saved? Does anybody recognize the quote? Yes, somebody's nodding in the back. Anybody know? Nope. No. Uh-uh. It's not Dostoevsky. Dostoevsky wouldn't be talking about himself in the uh, third person. <laughs> I mean this entire section that I just read. <laughs> it's um, Solzhenitsyn's 1970 Nobel, Nobel Prize speech, uh, where he talks a lot about the idea of beauty saving the world. It may seem ironic, considering, uh, well, I, would, I don't know if you could call Solzhenitsyn's writing beautiful. I mean, maybe you could. It's quite harsh. Some people would even argue that you couldn't call, you couldn't really consider Dostoevsky's writing particularly beautiful, I would argue, but there are plenty who would say that. And really, have we thought about this? We've heard it plenty of times, beauty will save the world, but have we really thought about what it means, actually? Because Solzhenitsyn seems to be talking not about beauty in general, but really about beauty of literature in, in particular. It is, after all, his Nobel Prize speech. Now, we maybe, I don't know, maybe we roll our eyes when we hear a particularly ascetic father talk about how novels will, you know, cause you were internal, uh, eternal damnation. I don't know, maybe not. Uh, we do read that sort of thing occasionally. But neither perhaps do we think that a work of art can have a profoundly life-altering effect. I don't mean theoretically, I mean practically. Perhaps we don't think that. Perhaps we do. I do. I'll uh, show my cards at the very beginning. Uh, but there are certain, it's interesting that Father already mentioned uh, a particular uh, scientific, uh, some scientific research that was done in Liverpool. Uh, there's another study that I found done in Emory University down in Atlanta, also in the same sort of sphere, which is now called, I think, literary neuroscience, whatever. Uh, this particular uh, study scanned the effect on the brain after reading novels, not during reading novels, but after, with the uh, their point was to find out what sort of effect, physical effect, did the reading of a novel have on the brain. They picked a trashy uh, thriller called Pompeii, which is going to be made into a movie, very, or has been made into a movie, is going to be you know, uh, showing very soon, and probably will be forgotten two months after it comes out on DVD. Um, they said it was important for them to have a strong narrative line. And what they did is that they measured the brain activity of each of these people at various stages of reading, and in particular after they finished. So they give them a piece of of the novel to read, then they would quiz them afterwards to make sure that they read it, and then a few days after the reading, they would see their, they would uh, scan their brain, and what they found was really interesting, that the brain continued to show the same signs of activity that it did right after they started to read, and what sections of the brains were activated, they were the sections that, uh, sections that regulate movement. So 
what ends up happening is that when a person reads about someone walking or someone running or someone suffering, the centers of the brain that would actually regulate that sort of behavior in you end up firing as if you are actually walking, you are actually suffering. Now that is profound. They uh, measured a five-day reaction for this trashy novel. And the, uh, the uh, scientists suggested as a sort of open question at the end, that if these people were tested reading something a little more substantial, something may perhaps like Dostoevsky, then it's quite possible that the effects on the brain could be uh, tabulated, could be scanned much longer than five days. Now, that really shouldn't surprise any of us. It only confirms what should, we should already know about the power of literature and the power of language. It is a power to shape a person. Now we even see it being reflected in the brain biologically. And even today, I don't think it would be too much of a stretch to say that, that literature can shape a whole culture. People still define themselves, even today, even when uh, TV and internet seems to be the entertainment of choice, people still, by and large, define themselves by what they read. But this leads to the next question. Is there anything we can turn to today, in our time, to help us guide our future parishioners, if we are going to be priests, not to an encounter with, uh, with a trashy thriller about Pompeii, but to an encounter with a work of art whose beauty can actually save us? Well, of course, the stock answer is classical literature, the wealth of world literature, centuries of it, everything from Homer to Sophocles to Dickens, to Austin, Dostoevsky, to Tolkien, and Lewis. But here's an article from a conservative-minded literature professor at Ryerson, at Ryerson University. Here's what he has to say about this wealth and what it means to us today. I'm sick of Flannery O'Connor. I'm also sick of Walker Percy, G.K. Chesterton, J.R.R. Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, T.S. Eliot, Gerard Manley Hopkins, and Dostoevsky. Actually, I'm sick of hearing about them from religious-minded readers because these tend to be the only authors they come up with when I ask them about what they read for literature. These writers, yes, brilliantly and movingly attest to literature's place in modern life, but what else do they have in common? They're all dead. Well, he seems to be leading us to the next logical question. What about modern literature? He has something to say about that as well. While religion significantly matters in minor literary contexts today, as with the eccentric popularity of Amish romance novels, for example, I didn't even know this existed, by the way, but anyway, <laughs> and in vulgar, vulgar commercial contexts such as Dan, Dan Brown's books, serious literary fiction, the kind of fiction that can really affect you, largely occupies its very own naked public square, shorn of any reference to religiously informed understandings of who and what and where from we are, which represents a marked break from centuries of literary production informed by Christian beliefs, traditions, and culture. Indeed, if any patch of our culture can set to be post-Christian, it is literature, declared writer Paul Ellie in Has Fiction Lost Its Faith, a much-discussed essay for the New York Times Book Review, which you haven't read you, if you haven't read, you really should. It's very easy to get on the internet. Absolutely recommended. Has fiction lost its faith? Very, very good read. Now, perhaps we should ask, what does this have to do with us? We, of course, being well-educated seminarians, appreciate the value of classical literature, even if we don't want to, <laughs> even if it is uh, appreciated upon us from above. And possibly we are well acquainted with Dostoevsky and all the rest. But here's the hard truth for us, especially future pastors. If a person has not been schooled in the classics, Father already mentioned something about this, and that from a very young age, that person will find it very hard to understand them and to relate to them. I'll give you an example. I, as John mentioned, I taught for about seven years at St. John's Academy in San Francisco which prides itself on its classical curriculum, uh, for real, not just on paper. Uh, people tend to come in there at a young age and stick towards most, almost to the end. And those kids 
that's that come in at an early age and end up getting the full uh, benefit of the classical curriculum uh, end up testing out of most uh, GED requirements in colleges. And uh, for example, several people in my graduating class ended up entering university at a, a sophomore level. But if someone comes in late, the difference between their upbringing or rather their uh, acceptance of what is or of culture in general is quite stark. And I mean, it's, it's this stark. I had a student who, ca who came in in ninth grade and we were talking about uh, the epistles of St. Paul. Now, this isn't even a question of uh, literary culture. This is a question of just religious culture. But it should give you an example of the general lack of information and ignorance that is widespread amongst uh, people nowadays, unfortunately. We were just talking about uh, the epistle to the Hebrews, and this person got up and asked, what is a Hebrew? And <laughs> this person got into St. John's Academy, meaning that they're not dumb because the entrance exams to St. John's are quite difficult. But it just shows you that there are some serious gaps in what young people are being taught. And if they're not being taught in the full, rich tradition of Western civilization, then there's no way they're going to choose a 1,000-page novel by Tolstoy over something that's perhaps 400 pages long but reads in about half an hour. I'm thinking something along the lines of Twilight. Yes, I don't particularly have much respect for that book, but never mind. <clears throat> it's true, very few people in our time are schooled in the classics. I don't think this is not a very serious problem. And the lack of compelling modern literature is also a very serious problem. Again, from this article by the aforementioned English professor. Indeed, were you to tell a clerk that you were interested in reading some morally serious contemporary writing, you might be introduced to the books of New York Times bestselling author David Shields. I've never heard of David Shields, but that's, as I found out later, is a problem. Shields won wide and admiring notice for his 2010 effort from outlets such as The New Yorker, The Atlantic, and The Wall Street Journal, and The Guardian. Indeed, it was named Best Book of the Year in over 30 publications. One reviewer predicted this book, Shield's book, will become a sort of Bible for the next generation of culture makers. And still another breathlessly reported that the book has already become required reading in university spheres. Galleys passed from one student to the next like an illicit hit of crack cocaine. Exactly what makes S.H.I.E.L.D. so appealing for so many contemporary critics, readers, and, as an apparent campus addiction, future writers? What is it? I think he appeals because he's an ethically-minded atheist bookworm. He's an exceedingly well-read provocateur and scattershot evangelizer for a fiercely anti-traditional literature of belief, one that prizes nonfiction over fiction, fragment over unity, self over all others, disenchantment, honesty, and mundaneness over the true good and the beautiful, a literature that affirms our mortal selves and this worldly reality as our only selves, our only reality. If we haven't heard about him, that speaks more about our ignorance, I think, that his lack of importance. Because I want you to pay close attention to a specific word used in one of the reviews. Culture makers. That word was not used haphazardly. It's not an accident. It is an incredibly important word for us as well. If we are interested in living in a country or in a world where the normal, regular Joe, the normal human being, doesn't become the kind of person that Shields wants all of us to become. We need to be realistic about what kids and even adults are being formed on morally. TV shows that have a clear agenda to normalize gay culture, for example, even in kid fare like Doctor Who. The last few years, I don't know if any of you are Whovians, I am, uh, but I've been astounded 
at the number of casual references to married gay couples that are just thrown in there for no reason at all. They have nothing to do with the plot. It, se it seems to be a, a really a sort of pro formal kind of agenda to prepare young kids to become okay with the idea. It, hap it happens all the time. It happens in almost every single episode. Any of you who watch Sherlock, same writer, perhaps that's not, in not an accident, but also the constant jokes about whether or not Sherlock and Dr. Watson are gay is bandied about as if it's the funniest thing on earth. Ever-increasing violence and sex on primetime TV is something that we perhaps aren't even noticing anymore because I would argue that shows in general tend to be a little bit better than they were 10 years ago. So we tend to forgive a lot more because their level of writing tends to get a lot better. But if you were to go back and watch uh, a pulp show like, say, The Pretender, I don't know if you ever watched The Pretender in the 90s, uh, that was considered to be pretty violent at the time. And compared to something like Burn Notice nowadays, uh, or even the the last uh, uh, the last season of, of Covert Affairs, which was a pretty uh, tame spy show compared to some other things you can watch on TV, you'd be amazed at how much the, the blood factor has gone up and how casual encounters of sex are just considered to be completely normal. And then, of course, there's the problem of uh, modern family, uh, which is very funny, uh, wh which is a very well-scripted uh, sitcom that describes real life family uh, events that would happen in any, in any potential family. And they're funny. But one of the main characters there is a, is a couple, a gay couple, who have, uh, who have uh, adopted a daughter. Now, I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't show a reality that is present in our, in our, in our life. What I'm trying to get you to notice is that there is, and I don't think you can argue with this, there is a clear shift in how gay characters are uh, presented, and that there does seem to be a real push towards getting people to accept it as one of several possible options. Then there is the widespread popularity of, of a show we know as Game of Thrones. A very well done show with excellent production values, good writing, that presents a moral worldview that I would argue is completely nihilistic. And it presents it as something that is, well, it's good. This is the way it should be. And, and the media all around is constantly presenting the, uh, this show as a sort of standard bearer for where fantasy fiction or in general fiction should go. Uh, there's, there are already being books being printed of cr uh, critical research on Game of Thrones as if it was some sort of a piece of classical literature as if it was on par with Lord of the Rings, which is not, by the way. <laughs> this is the reality we live in. This is the culture that we are surrounded with. Now, maybe that would have been okay if there was a strong, vivid, compelling counterweight on the Christian side. But what do we have in popular culture that we could attribute to, we'll say, a Christian writer. We have the Lord of the Rings, Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings. I enjoyed them. But even then, 10 years ago or wherever, there were certain moments in those films where key moral aspects of the books were wiped clean. Faramir, for example, who clearly makes a choice to not fall under the influence of the ring, which is a very, very important point for the whole book, that somebody can actually look at the ring, which is sort of, you know, the, the symbol of, uh, the, of temptation with a large T. He's able to look at it and say, no, I will not. Yes, he has an inner struggle, but that inner struggle isn't shown in obvious action as it is in, in the movies. In the movies, he's, that uh, power of choice is taken away from explicitly. Peter Jackson says that the power of evil is lessened if we show someone able to resist it. So that is the worldview of someone who is making a movie of a Christian, a very, very Christian book. Sort of troubling. And then, of course, he goes on to make, to make The Hobbit, which is little more, let's be honest, than a very, very, very expensive uh, exercise in making money. What about Narnia? <sighs> Don't get me... <laughs> uh. 
I mean, maybe the line in the Witch in the Wardrobe was okay. Maybe. I'd, I'd argue with it. But Green Mist? Have you all seen The Boys with the Dawn Treader? Green Mist? Like, we couldn't tell that these are situations in which the main characters are being tempted between a right choice and a wrong one. We have to have a big, a slimy green mist tell us that, uh-oh, the main character is about to have a very dangerous situation. Oh, well, yeah, okay. And this was made by apparently Christian people. The producers were, or uh, was a Protestant company, Walden Media, which has now since, by the way, fallen apart. Not surprising. They, they see, Christian fair, popular Christian fair, doesn't allow the viewer to be challenged enough to make his own decisions about right and wrong. They want to shove it in your face, say, this is right, this is wrong. No possibility of any moral ambiguity, no possibility of any texture, of any nuance, no possibility of actually enjoying the thing you're watching or the thing you're reading. And what else do we have? Oh, yes, that's right. There's a remake of Left Behind coming out very soon with Nicolas Cage in the main role. I can't wait. I'm so excited about that, right? No. I'm not trying to talk up the culture war here. We've heard enough about the culture war. Let's be honest. Rather than trying just to loudly decry all of modern popular culture, which is very easy to do, and is done with reckless abandon by Christians of all stripes, and end up throwing out the baby with the bathwater, I suggest a more positive approach. And I want to return to that word, culture-making. Culture-making should be our most active, most important endeavor, I think. That is real missionary work. That is pastoral work. That is just plain Christian work. And don't take it from me. Take it from the words of Ivan Ilyin, uh, not very well known, but very um, profound orthodox thinker and theologian and philosopher of the last century who was steeped in a patristic worldview. Here's what he has to say about culture making. The good news of the gospel is that the heavens have already come down to earth in the person of the God-man, that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and that the possibility and reality of a meaningful taking on and transfiguration of the world exists. The gospel brings to the world not a curse, but a promise, and to humanity not death, but salvation and joy. It teaches not flight from the world, but the Christianization of the world. Thus, the sciences, the arts, politics, and the social order, but especially the arts, can all be those spiritual hands with which a Christian takes the world. And the calling of a Christian is not to chop off his hands, but to imbue their work and their toil with the living spirit of Christ. Christianity has a great calling, he says, which many do not ever realize. This purpose can be defined as the creation of a Christian culture. It's strange. He speaks of Christian culture here or the creation of it as almost an ascetic labor. Is that possible? Is Ilian just another dreamer? Well, let's go even more recent. recent the recently canonized Saint Porphyrios, who affected so many people with a love that just poured out of him like fire. He says, for a person to become a Christian, he must have a poetic soul. He must become a poet. Period. Christ does not wish insensitive souls in his company. Poetic hearts embrace love and sense it deeply. But can a child raised on nothing but cartoons become a poet? Can a converted adult who never read anything except the latest cheap thriller ever become a sensitive soul? Probably, but it's not easy. I'll ask it differently. Can a person not accustomed to reading and understanding poetry ever appreciate the poetics of church hymnography, for example. Well, take this. You should be able to recognize it. Today is born of the Virgin, him who holdest all creation in the hollow of his hand. He whose essence is untouchable is wrapped in swaddling clothes as a babe. The God who from 
of old established the heavens lieth in a manger. He who showered the people with manna in the wilderness feedeth on milk from the breast. The bridegroom of the church calleth the magi. The son of the virgin accepts gifts from them. We worship thy nativity, O Christ. Show us also thy divine theophany. This text is earth-shattering. But many people won't get it. They'll think, oh, that's pretty. Oh, yeah, that's nice. But they may not get, first of all, the allusions to the various parts of the scriptures, which are necessary to create the effect of the hymn. They may not understand, if they haven't been raised to reading poetry, if they haven't been raised to think critically, to think deeper than just what the sentence says before you, they may not be able to understand the effect of the juxtaposition of opposites, which is so constantly used in our hymnography to create that sense of, oh my goodness, here's a paradox, what do I do? I just stand in awe and I pray. They won't get it. They'll think, wow, that's interesting. I haven't thought of it that way, which maybe is a good first step, but it's not enough for you to stand in awe of the mystery. It's not enough for you to go from purely a literal reading of the words to a contemplation of their meaning, to true prayer. And Finally, they may not even realize that this hymn has a clear connection to Pascha, which is a sort of third level to it. And if you knew that, you would appreciate it so much more. In fact, and I say this with pain, many people would more likely snicker at the allusion to female anatomy than appreciate the beauty of what was said about the one who showered the people with manna feeding from the breast of the mother of God. They are more likely to snicker than wonder at the mystery of the creator of the world choosing to be a defenseless child. So how can we make culture? Well, it's not easy. Um, But there are several things that we can do and that we should do. The first is perhaps the harder, and that is that I honestly think that if we've chosen to, if we've made that step already to go into seminary, it means that we have chosen to engage our world in a different way than many others. It means that we have a responsibility to become cultured, and I don't mean only in the works of the church. I mean read the classics. If you haven't read them, read them. I mean as much as possible. Again and again. Go back as far as you need to. Listen and become well acquainted with classical music. I'm not the first person to suggest this. There are plenty of ascetics. Mm -hmm. Reporting it. St. John of Shanghai, San Francisco, yeah. Uh, And the new elders, uh, all of whom were ascetics, they will all tell you that if you are going to become a sensitive soul that is going to be together with Christ, you have to become sensitive to music. And you can't do that if all you listen to is stuff that was done after 1950. It's just not possible. Go to the opera. Well, check to make sure that it's the right production first. Because goodness, I took my dear wife to, to a production of my favorite uh, opera, Mephistopheles by Boito in San Francisco. And well, there's a witch's Sabbath and they took it <laughs> to rather San Francisco extreme, shall we say. <clears throat> uh, go to the ballet. Yes, go to the ballet. But make sure it's an, old, it's an older uh, choreography. <laughs> uh, or if it's one of the new ones, check out the work beforehand. Uh, see the latest Impressionist exhibit coming from the Musée d'Orsay. Go. These are important things. They are not secondary. As you do this, you shouldn't, I think you shouldn't also close your eyes, your ears towards contemporary culture as well. Now that's harder because it's hard to find as we already mentioned, books, music, that is on a good enough level. It's hard to, especially if we want to be edified. We often have to wade into pretty dark territory uh, if we want to get, even if we want to get something good out of it. Um, I recommend this book if you are interested in this. It's called Beauty Will Save the World. 
incidentally. It's written by Gregory Wolf, a Catholic, where he specifically addresses this sort of uh, culture war position that everything modern is evil and we should only focus on old things. And he says, basically, that's hogwash, and he gives you a whole list of modern writers, living writers, one of whom, by the way, is Orthodox, Scott Cairns. Some of you may have heard him uh, read poetry recently at... Uh, I really wish I could have gone there. Like, we could we could make it out of the World Series. Of, but anyway, um, they are out there. You just have to find them. This book will help you. Uh, support those who try to build or create culture. Uh, John already mentioned Conquering Time. Conquering Time is a fledgling group of insane people uh, who actually think that they can affect people uh, in real ways with literature, with performance, with music. Check us out online, conquering-time.org. We recently rebuilt our website and there's a lot more content. Um, there's regular blog posts on uh, Christianity and culture. We're really interested in expanding the conversation right now. What we've done so far is performance pieces, <clears throat> many of them based on uh, folk traditions of various cult uh, countries, and mixed them up, sort of a storytelling music uh, mashup, <laughs> if you can say. Some of you have, have been at these concerts, and they, they have been very well received. We've performed them already in San Francisco, in Philadelphia, in Boston, uh, in Paris, and in Moscow. And everywhere we've been, the response has been pretty overwhelming, Not not in numbers, but in uh, in what we in what I I hear from people who come with me afterwards and tell how they've been affected by it and that's exactly what we want to do. But we need more people involved in the conversation. We need more people involved in the creation of culture. Uh, the first thing you can do is is go to the website, read our uh, read our blog posts, comment on them, go to the Facebook page, see what's going on. Um, subscribe to uh, publications such as Touchstone Magazine. I would recommend. They're very good. They give you a very good sense of, of what it means to be cultured in a Christian sense. Image Magazine is also an, an interesting one. I, I haven't uh, done much reading of it, and I get the sense that it can be a, um, a bit strange sometimes, but it is a living sort of encounter um, between modernity and traditional culture, which I think is something very interesting and very important. S support... Uh, Support culture makers. That's all. I'm. That's all I have to say. Uh, and here's my very, very brief uh, plugging moment. <laughs> uh, I wrote this book recently. This is a um, fantasy novel based on Russian fairy tales and the lives of saints. Uh, wouldn't you believe it? An odd combination. <laughs> this came out came out of the um, conversations we've had with various people in Conquering Time. It's very much an attempt to engage. The modern world through uh, the medium of story. Uh, we have books over there, a few uh, available for sale if you'd like. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Sorry, John. Cash only. Cash only. No, but we do have a few left over in the in the uh, in bookstore if you want to buy them as well. They're cheaper here though. <laughs> now, I just want to end with this thought: the search for beauty and harmony, really, if we think about it, characterizes striving after anything. Have you ever heard Richard Dawkins speak about evolution? It's actually quite inspiring. The man talks like a minister. He uses the word beauty constantly. And if you didn't know that the man is a crazy atheist, you could listen and think, wow, he, any minute now he's going to say glory to God for his creation. <laughs> he even calls himself, uh, how does he call it? A, um, something, not a lapsed Anglican, but a, a cultural Anglican, I think, is what he calls himself. Anyway, uh, mathematicians can all oftentimes reach a level of appreci appreciation of beauty that mimics a religious experience. It's true. You can read about this. I had a, a conductor back in, in Berkeley who her in, engagement with music was on par with, with prayer. She, uh, For her, it was even explicitly so. She would, she would schedule concerts on Eastern Orthodox Easter every year because she was a uniad. So she celebrated it on the, on the same date as as the Orthodox, but she wasn't particularly church. So she would she would make concerts on those days, and for her it would be an an engagement with the divine. She one one year she um, she performed the uh, uh, Saint ba uh, Saint Matthew Passion by Bach, 
uh, with the Philharmonia Baroque Orchestra, which is one of the best uh, Baroque orchestras in the world. This is in San Francisco Bay Area. And at the beginning of the second act, uh, there's a, a very long alto solo, a sort of break in the action where, where the soloist is looking at the, the tied up and scourged Jesus and wondering what, what this all means. And she, my conductor, on stage, sat on her, um, on her pulpit, not on the pulpit, but on, on the stand, uh, and hugged her knees and stayed in the sort of bowed posture the entire aria. And she did this every single night because for her it was an, an encounter with beauty, the kind of beauty that could potentially save. So perhaps Solzhenitsyn and Dostoevsky weren't too far from the truth when they said that beauty can save the world. And I want to end with Solzhenitsyn's words again. There's a special quality in the essence of beauty, a special quality in the status of art. The conviction carried by a genuine work of art is absolutely indisputable and tames even the most strongly opposed heart. It is vain to affirm that which the heart does not confirm. In contrast, a work of art bears within itself its own confirmation. Works steeped in truth and presenting it to us vividly alive will take hold of us, will attract us to themselves with great power. And no one ever, even in a later age, will presume to negate them. And so perhaps that old trinity of truth and good and beauty is not just the formal outworn formula it used to seem to us during our heady materialistic youth. Perhaps the whimsical, unpredictable, unexpected branches of beauty will make their way through and soar up to that very place and in this way perform the work of truth and good and beauty. And in that case, it was not a slip of the tongue for Dostoevsky to say, beauty will save the world, but a prophecy. <laughs>